If you have any questions for me, please put them in the Q&A box, not the chat. I will be monitoring the Q&A and I'll do my best to answer questions as they arise, but depending on how many come in, um, it, it may be, be difficult, but I will do my best. And I'm gonna keep the session to the hour. So what I plan to do is um, give some remarks for about 35, 40 minutes or so, and then I will leave some time at the end if people do have uh, some questions that I haven't answered throughout. And then if we finish early, great, uh, but I will have you out uh, before one o'clock. So for those of who don't, those of you who don't know me, I am a partner at Learners and a arbitrator with Arbitration Place. And one of the reasons that I actually started this series was thinking back on my days as counsel. Um, I could have used some of the kind of basic training that I'm offering today. So, but the idea kind of crystallized when I was working on the Arbitration Matters website, which many of you know about. It's where I post on a regular basis summaries of arbitration-related cases that are released across the country. Um, and you can, can subscribe to it if you like at www.arbitrationmatters.com. But it occurred to me that I was seeing a lot of counsel that I was familiar with from doing, from my practice, counsel practice as a commercial litigation counsel. And I thought about my own experience and looking at those names coming up as counsel on those cases and thought it would be useful to provide a, just a general basic um, course, so to speak, on general basic arbitration principles. And if you've already got the basics, sometimes what you need is a little practical guidance on how you can use the basics or precedents or that sort of thing that you can use in your practice. So that's what I'm hoping to our, uh, provide in this session. So this is for people who need the fundamentals, but also who pe people who know the fundamentals uh, and want to know best way, best practices on how to put them into practice. After this session, I will circulate a list to everybody of the resources and precedents that I talk about today um, and a recording of this, this session. So today's session is about appointing the arbitrator, practical advice and best practices. And I think this is one of the least discussed topics, and I think it's a really important one, um, especially on the issue of terms of appointment of the arbitrator and fees. And so some of the practical issues about appointment of the, the arbitration panel or the arbitrator and, and um, some of the other kind of mechanics of the appointment process, I think are, are not discussed a lot, although you read in the rules how it's supposed to be done. So I'm hoping to provide today a little bit of practical guidance on that. Um, obviously, the appointment of the arbitrator is one of the most important aspects of an arbitration. The fact that parties can choose their decision maker is one of the top reasons parties choose arbitration. But the challenge is often that arbitration agreements don't always provide an adequate mechanism for that. And so I'm going to talk today about what happens if the parties agree on the arbitrator or at least the process and what happens if they if they don't. And then once the arbitrator has been appointed, um, you know, fees and all that sort of thing. So I'd like to talk uh, cover today decisions about appointing a sole arbitrator, a panel of three, considerations about processes, mechanisms for appointment, what happens if the parties don't consent, the role of institutions in arbitral appointments, uh, practical tips if you've got to bring an application to a court for an appointment of an arbitrator, and again, terms of, appoint of appointment. What does the actual contract between the parties and the arbitrator look like? What kind of terms should be included? So let's start with some some basics. I'm going to make some general comments about best practices and processes, but they're always subject to either the the law uh, of the seat, uh, the party's agreement, or their chosen rules. So sometimes what I say may not apply to your your arbitration. The importance of the arbitration agreement in the arbitrator selection process cannot be understated. That, you know, the arbitration agreement is the critical clause in the, the party's business agreement that, per, that is, is, determines how the process will go and what issues will be covered. There can be, as most of you know, a pre or post arbitration agreement, and people may be surprised to find out that a post dispute arbitration agreement is more common than you think. So the and we're seeing that increasingly, uh, given the backlog of the courts due to um, 
the pandemic. Parties who were originally engaged in the court process are now thinking that all are part of their dispute um, could go to arbitration and be dealt with more quickly and more efficiently. So then the question, whether you're dealing with the, the issue during the business negotiation agreement stage or the post-dispute stage is sole arbitrator or panel of three. And if you don't turn your mind to this, there is a default position either in the relevant legislation or if the parties have at least chosen procedural rules in those rules. So for example, under the Ontario Arbitration Act and most of the provincial domestic acts, the default is a single arbitrator. Under most provincial international acts, the default is a panel of three arbitrators. So you really do want to be specific if you, if you have a preference, and you probably should. So what should the ar arbitration agreement contain with respect to the issue of the appointment of the arbitrator? Naming a person a specific individual can be risky, unless, of course, this is in the post-dispute stage and the arbitration is going to proceed imminently. And then if the parties can agree early on on the arbitrator, all, all the better. Otherwise, you may want to set out the qualifications of the kind of expertise uh, that you'd like your arbitrator to have. Um, don't be overly specific. I've had a case in which the criteria were so specific it wasn't possible to find a candidate to meet those criteria. It should set out the process or the mechanism for appointment. Not all cases um, will parties agree on who the arbitrator is. And if that is not determined and there are no rules, you're into court, which is not always desirable. The arbitration agreement can either specify a particular customized uh, process for appointing the arbitrator, or the parties can simply rely upon the, the procedural rules uh, that they choose. And of course, any of these terms can be later changed on the consent of the, of the parties. So let's look at the pros and cons of a sole arbitrator and a panel of three. Pros of a sole arbitrator, less expensive, but the reality is that studies have shown that the real costs of an arbitration are actually the council fees. Um, I think it's an important consideration, but one that, that um, needs to be considered within the context of all of the costs. It can Appointing a sole arbitrator can result in a much faster appointment process, obviously, unless there's a dispute. The parties agree on a, on a person after perhaps uh, an exchange of candidates and the person is appointed and, and away you go. The cons, it may be more difficult for parties to agree on a single person, which is why a panel of three um, may make some sense. And so that's why it's important to have a mechanism in your arbitration agreement for what happens if you don't agree. And if there's no appeal provision in the arbitration agreement, there are some who have concerns about trusting the outcome of their dispute on a single person. Tribunal three, pros. It may be a good compromise, as I've said, if there are people who, if there are, no, it's no agreement on who the sole arbitrator is. In that case, in, in most circumstances, each party or each side, if you've got a multi-party arbitration, chooses one member of the tribunal, and then those members choose the chair or, or the president of the, of the panel. Sometimes the parties themselves cho choose that, that chair. And it's important to stress that even though there are that two of the, the panel members are chosen by the parties, one by each of the parties, there is still an obligation for all the panel members to be independent and impartial. And the reason it's important to emphasize that is people, parties sometimes get the sense that the uh, arbitrator they chose is, is their arbitrator, and that is not the expectation. But interestingly enough, the concern about bias in favor of the party that appointed the arbitrator is something that you still hear about. And, and there have been studies which, interestingly enough, show that the dissenting arbitrator is invariably uh, the, the arbitrator chosen by the losing party. Uh, so that that's food for thought. Um, culturally, this issue is a little less... Um, uh, big in in Canada, but it's it's a debate that that happens a lot in the United States states where there has been historically a tradition um, that the party appointed nominees are not independent and impartial. But that's not best practices any longer. 
One of the, the benefits that people see of a three-party tribunal is that you've got three people making a decision which can provide the parties with comfort in circumstances where the agreement or the rules or the legislation provides for no appeal. There's, there's comfort in knowing that you've got three decision makers involved in dealing with the problem. The cons, and this is a significant one, a three-person tribunal is more expensive, and it's more than three times expensive um, than a single arbitrator. And that's because although the arbitrators try to divide up responsibility, they're in hearings together and they're involved in deliberations together. So you've got three participants and sometimes they're communicating with one another um, during deliberations. The importance of the chair is something that's not often discussed. And so again, when you're thinking about your mechanism for choosing the arbitra arbitral tribunal, you wanna give some thought to how the chair is appointed. And I'm going to be talking in, in the next uh, boot camp session about communications with tribunal members and potential arbitrators before their appointment so that you can screen for some of the things that are important to you in an arbitrator. And I and and so I'm going to put that issue to the side for the moment, but I just wave a flag of caution that direct communications to any of the members of the tribunal before they are appointed, which is a very common occurrence and an acceptable occurrence, has to be managed in a way to minimize the risk of potential conflicts down, down the road. And I think that's crucial because a lot of council, um, I think, aren't aware of the potential ramifications and sometimes can compromise the situation with the first, first communication. So now that I've scared you, um, I'll, I'll move on to the importance of the chair. The chair has a unique role in a three-person tribunal. It's often the person who will decide the procedural matters alone without the other two uh, tribunal members if the parties agree uh, on that course of action or the rules they've chosen provide for that, which means that where there are what we call kind of discovery type issues, you know, in litigation, those are decided often by the chair who therefore has a significant amount of influence in how the, the, our, the proceeding uh, moves forward and what evidence goes to the tribunal as a as a whole. And the, the chair is also responsible for maintaining the dynamics of, of the tribunal, maintaining good relationships, good working relationships, and promoting and guiding deliberations. So the chair really sets the tone for both the process and for the relationship uh, among the tribunal and council and the relationship among the members of the tribunal. And most importantly, if there is a lack of agreement in the award among the tribunal members, under many rules, it is the chair's award that will constitute the, the, the award uh, of the tribunal. So the chair's appointment is, is absolutely critical. So let's move on to the mechanism for appointment of members of the tribunal or the single arbitrator. Obviously, the appointment on consent is ideal and, and very commonly works. How, how do parties do this or how do counsel do this? Often simplest is best and there's just an exchange of names between counsel, which they obtain often from colleagues' recommendations. You, you, it's familiar to see emails among counsel and firms saying, I've got this kind of a dispute, who do you recommend? Um, and also doing due, due diligence. If you're interested in nominating an arbitrator, you want to know a little bit about that arbitrator's disposition to the extent that that information is available. So how do they how do they run a process? How do they run an arbitration? Um, and and many arbitrators promote themselves by doing writing and that sort of thing. So it's it's quite easy to find information about arbitrators without making any contact with them whatsoever, which then allows you to create a list which you'll ex exchange with opposing counsel. And the the often the reaction among among parties is to reflexively reject the first or you know choices uh, that the opposing party makes for arbitrators. 
And I've seen this in practice. And once you get down to your second list, people are prepared to talk. And, and I think parties just feel reluctant often at the outset to agree to anything. And part of the process of the arbitration is to, to get beyond that. So sometimes it's easy to kind of narrow the dispute by agreeing ahead of time. If you can't agree on the person, let's talk about the kind of person you're looking for. So you often see things like, we want somebody from a roster, a specified roster. We want somebody from ADR chambers. Or we want somebody from arbitration place. And once you agree on that, you narrow the candidates and it's often easier to, to uh, choose an arbitrator. Or you may say you want your arbitrator to have certain qualifications. The, the process can be designed in any way that the parties want. You know, without being flippant, you can literally draw a name out of a hat, uh, you know, or toss a coin. If that's the process that the parties choose, it's binding. Or you can choose somebody else to make the decision. And the 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 flaw, potential flaw in that, of course, is if the decision is 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 delegated to someone who is not prepared to act, for example, you're back to a situation where the parties can't reach agreement. So what if there's no agreement? Or what if one party simply will not engage in the process at all? then you may be on to a, an application to the court for the appointment of an arbitrator. And this is a surprisingly rare occurrence. And, and I think it's because it's, it's probably the least desirable option in part because the dispute becomes public and most parties choose arbitration in part because they'd like their dispute to remain private. So there is in, in, the, in the legislation of the seat, um, so most of you are coming from Canada. So the the if your seat is 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 in one of the Canadian provinces, the legislation invariably provides for an application to the court, and the court will make a decision on who the arbitrator is, and there's no right of appeal from that decision. So number one, you've handed over your decision making to of of your arbitrator to another body, which is for, for most parties, not desirable. So that's one reason a court application isn't, isn't desirable. But it, it also is not desirable sometimes because courts are not familiar necessarily with all of the various candidates whose names are put forward. So they are very familiar with some of the former judges who are acting as arbitrators and feel very comfortable uh, choosing and appointing them. Sometimes they know some of the more prominent arbitrators, and so they feel comfortable appointing them. Um, but not every arbitration can bear the costs associated with those arbitrators. And so one of the challenges that you have as a party in seeking a court to appoint an arbitrator the court doesn't know is the court doesn't necessarily know who the best arbitrators are. And again, you're leaving the decision in the hands of a third party. But if you're in the unfortunate position where you, you simply have to bring a court application, there are a few precedents because it doesn't happen very often. So what is your what should your material look like? There's some really helpful guidance from a decision of Justice Myers, which actually came out earlier this year, and I will send you the link um, after this webinar, called Magna International Against Granite Real Estate, 2022 ONSC 2020. And I think the most important point that Justice Myers makes is that you can compare this process to the process used in bankruptcy and insolvency proceedings where an officer of the court, a uh, receiver or monitor is being appointed. What information does the court want to see in order to be satisfied that this is a suitable person for that role? And in this case, the, the main issue was whose affidavit was put forward and the court was critical of the fact that the affidavit used was an illegal assistance affidavit on information and belief on contentious issues from the counsel who argued the application. So that's number one, choose, choose your affiant wisely. But the affidavit should contain at least the following uh, information, a description of the, of the nature of the dispute and the amounts at issue, the arbitration agreement itself, that may include, you know, the business agreement and the relevant legislation, the legislative requirements. Um, it is important for the court to know and for the parties to know which act applies, domestic, international, etc. 
who the proposed arbitrators are that the applicant is putting forward. So they, they, they should have their CVs attached. The material should include a consent or a statement that the uh, arbitrators are willing to serve if appointed. Um, and if there are any disclosures that the arbitrator must make about issues that may give rise to challenges for conflicts of interest, for example, those should be included in the material. And if there are no such disclosures that need to be made, that should be in the material as well. The fact that the arbitrator is available over a, a period of time um, you know, has his or her practice is not too busy that uh, the person can't take on this responsibility. And then information about hourly rates, per diem rates, whatever they may, they, they may be. And then the application should address why the parties can't agree. So what are their reasons for dispute uh, about who the nominees are and ob objections that the opposing party has made to your nominee. And with that information, the court should be in a position to make a decision that you can at least live with because you've educated the court about the, the various alternatives and you've also lined up your arbitrators so that the court won't be in a position of making an appointment of somebody who doesn't have time or isn't willing to serve. So that's a court application. Appointment by an arbitral institution, and this is very common as well. If the parties can't reach an agreement and they don't want to go to court, they may agree to use one of the institutions simply as an appointing authority. And not everybody knows that the institutions provide appointing authority services for a fee, and it's usually very a re reasonable fee, without the requirement that they actually administer the arbitration. So if parties want an ad hoc arbitration, but they are not able to agree on their arbitrator, that is an ideal solution. And the institution will use the rules of that institution. So for example, in ADRIC, the mechanism is that ADRIC will provide the parties counsel with a list of three names. Those counsel strike out the names of those arbitrators uh, they object to and rank those that are left and respond to ADRIC. And if Adric finds there's no common ground there, Adric will do this a second time. And if there's still no common ground, Adric will appoint somebody without um, the party's consent, um, but not on the list of those arbitrators who were objected to. So the Adric formula mechanism provides some input from the parties, uh, but may not result in a choice that either party has specifically requested. The ICC rules provide that if the parties don't agree, the ICC itself decides. And the UNCITRAL arbitration rules provides that if the parties can't agree, they can go to the Secretary General of the Permanent Court of Arbitration in The Hague to make that decision. And that generally the institutions are looking for people whose independence they're comfortable with, who have experience, knowing something about the dispute, uh, who, that the institution has confidence, has the, the expertise to deal with it. Um, and international cases, sometimes the nationality of the arbitrator is important. The parties would not want the arbitrator to be uh, somebody from one side's nationality uh, and not the other, for exa example. Um, and, and so there are a variety of mechanisms under a variety of rules. And if you're going to choose specific rules, uh, read those rules very carefully to make sure you're satisfied with the fact that at some point, if parties can't agree, the institution will be making that decision for you. The Another reason why you may want to refer to rules is that some rules provide for an emergency arbitrator to be appointed if, for example, either party needs interim measures or what you call injunct injunctive relief in uh, the court system, that person, the emergency arbitrator can be appointed before the, the, the arbitrator who will hear the merits of the proceeding has been appointed in urgent cases. And without that kind of mechanism in the chosen rules, once again, you're back to court. So the next topic uh, I'd like to address is again, one that, people don't talk about a lot. And that is what should the terms of appointment be between the parties and the arbitrator? This agreement 
is the source of the arbitrator authority. So it's absolutely essential that it contains all of the terms that the parties think are important. And there, there is no standard form. And I'm going to send to you following this uh, webinar a number of precedents to give you some ideas of the kind of clauses that you may want to include in your terms of appointment. Generally, they're drafted by the arbitrator who has standard forms of uh, terms of appointment. They're always open for discussion uh, uh, with the parties in the same way that, you know, lawyers term retainer agreements are. Um, but arbitrators will have standard terms that they feel comfortable with. So I'm going to talk about um, a great precedent. Uh, Bill Horton on his uh, website has some wonderful, I think he calls them tools and uh, information. He has a, a couple of terms of reference documents, uh, terms of appointment documents that are really helpful. So I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit about those when I explain the kinds of terms that are useful to include in your terms of appointment. So let's start with the basic ad hoc arbitration, single arbitrator. What should it cover? Certainly the title of proceedings, you want to know who the parties are, you want to know what the relevant legislation is. Is this a domestic act? Is this a, an international law act, uh, act case? Where's the seat? Um, the parties and their counsel and how everybody may be contacted. The arbitration agreement itself should be in there so everybody understands the scope of the dispute. When the appointment takes effect, because that is the source of the arbitrator's authority, and generally the appointment takes effect as soon as the terms of reference are signed by all parties and the, uh, the arbitrator. A term I really like is that the parties should, when they have a dispute, be required to speak to one another before they come to the arbitrator. And this avoids some of the things you see in court where parties attend often on a discovery matter and they've never communicated with one, one another. Um, and so many disputes, as we all know intuitively, can be resolved without a decision maker uh, getting involved if the parties simply talk to one another. So I love that term. The immunity of the arbitrator is something that the arbitrator is going to want to see in the terms of appointment. And essentially those terms include a release against the arbitrator and indemnity and immunity. And the arbitrator has the same immunity as a superior court justice in, in any of, of the provinces. And specifically, that means that the, the arbitrator will not be called as a witness uh, with respect to any of the issues that arose in the arbitration, for example. Um, and I can make a little pitch for any of the arbitrators in, in the audience, notwithstanding those terms, you will want to get arbitrator insurance, which is very inexpensively obtained through ADRIC. Um, you cannot rely upon your law pro counsel insurance in the event there is a claim. Other issues that the terms of appointment should cover. Increasingly important to all parties is confidentiality and cybersecurity issues. And there are a number of guidelines out there, some of which I'll refer to in uh, the material I send to you after, the, after this webinar, which give you some indication of the issues that should be canvassed among the parties. There may be very sensitive issues or very sensitive parties to the arbitration who are, for example, more likely to be hacked, governments as parties, for example. And so it's absolutely essential that the parties agree on a protocol and then ensure that the arbitrator is equipped to conduct the proceedings under that protocol, including what happens if there is a breach. The arbitrator should be given the authority to decide procedural matters. Uh, often parties can't agree on those, those issues, and it's not uncommon that there's a residual discretion on the part of the arbitrator to decide procedural matters in order to move the arbitration forward. Um, the arbitration, the, the terms of, arbitra of, of uh, appointment should also have a, a statement that all terms are subject to the applicable law. For example, the parties may have agreed that there's no appeal of the award, but it may be that at the seat of the arbitration, it is Ill, it not legal to contract out of an appeal, for example. So you want to make sure that your, your agreement remains sound because it is must be interpreted consistently with the applicable law. 
Another very important issue that must be in the terms of appointment is the arbitrators and parties disclosures. And, and again, I'm going to do another webinar about, about that issue, and that's uh, going to be next month, and I'll tell you a little bit about that in a moment. But these are circumstances of which the arbitrator or parties or counsel are aware, which may give rise to a conflict of interest, and which therefore may give rise to ground uh, to challenge or have the arbitrator disqualified. You want all of those potential issues on the table once parties consent to the arbitrator being appointment appointed notwithstanding those disclosures, then they are again by the terms of appointment, uh, not permitted to challenge the arbitrator later on for uh, based on any of those grounds. And that's just a, a, a simple rule that ensures that the, the proceedings do not get hijacked by a, a uh, an issue that a party could have raised earlier and, and did not. There should also be a reference to what the arbitrator does after the arbitration with all of the data, all of the documents that the arbitrator has received in the course of the arbitration. And so it's common to have kind of a document destruction term. 60 days, 30 days, something like that. 60 days is probably a better number because the the rules and, and some of the rules and the legislation allow for post-award clarifications to the award. Um, and so the arbitrator will wanna keep the file for that period of time. But after that, presumably the parties do not want any of that data or that information in the hands of third parties uh, in any event. Now, it's sometimes the case that arbitrators are asked to hold on to the file if there's an appeal or a set aside, a chance that the, the, uh, the court is going to be asked to remit an issue back to the arbitrator, that may be a good reason why the arbitrator should retain the file for longer than the, the standard period of time. And if that's the case, the parties need to ask the arbitrator that um, and make a special request. And some arbitrators have terms that if they're going to be required to store uh, data and documents in a secure location that the parties pay for, for that as well. The Standard terms of any contract, you may want to indicate the applicable law, have an entire agreement clause, etc. So as I say, I'm going to, I'm going to circulate some precedents. Fees. This is a delicate issue from some people's perspective, but it's an absolutely essential issue for parties and, and the arbitrator to discuss. So the question is, when do you discuss it? I think it's pretty obvious that you'd really like to know the arbitrator's fee before the arbitrator is appointed. And this is something that can be learned during a pre-appointment contact, a pre-appointment meeting. As I say, I'm going to deal with that in the next webinar because that is fraught with some risk, but there are ways to do it in order to, to uh, maintain the integrity of the process. Arbitrators generally charge uh, both an hourly rate and a per diem rate, although many charge just an hourly rate. And the per diem rate is for hearings. It's based on a seven or eight hour day. Um, you'll want clarification that in that in the terms uh, in terms of appointment, and what that generally means is that if a hearing day uh, finishes early, the arbitrator is paid the per diem rate. If the day goes late, the arbitrator is paid the the same per diem rate. So that provides some 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 um, uh, uh, certainty for for the parties. Who is responsible to pay the fees? It must be the parties. And, and certainly this is my opinion, but I would be surprised if many uh, would disagree with me. You don't want the council to be responsible. And certainly as council, you would not want to agree to be responsible to an arbitrator's, uh, for an arbitrator's fees and then have to chase your client for those fees, particularly if your client is not the successful party. So the parties are jointly and severally liable for the fees. And that's one of the reasons they sign um, the, the terms of reference either directly or through their counsel. The arbitration will invariably proceed with staged deposits. And so at the very outset, it's not uncommon for the arbitrator to ask for a small deposit for all of the matters that lead up to and include say the first procedural meeting. And then at the first procedural meeting, when the arbitrator has a greater sense of the nature of the dispute, all of the issues, how long the parties think the, the whole process will take, the arbitrator then can estimate uh, various installment payments along the way um, and will render interim accounts um, and call for the newest installments to be paid um, 
you know, as, as the matter progresses. Occasionally, like all matters, uh, there are some um, unexpected events which can make the proceedings take longer or cost more than people expect. But part of the case management role of the arbitrator is to try to minimize that and to provide accurate estimates. Obviously, if the arbitrator has more funds in on deposit at the end of the uh, arbitration, the remainder of the funds are returned to the parties. And what happens if those fees aren't paid? So I think a lot of counsel are surprised in their first uh, arbitration when they get a notice that the arbitral tribunal has completed its award and it's ready for release and it will happily do so upon payment of a further installment payment. Um, and that is very common that the, the arbitral tribunal will make sure that it's fully paid before it releases its award. And there are some good reasons for that other than the fact that the tribunal wants to make sure that it gets paid. Um, there become optic issues when one party is fully paid up and another party is not. Um, and and it, just, it it makes sense from a good uh, 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 practice, good practice perspective to make sure that everybody, all the parties are up to date in, in their deposits and, and fully paid. Of course, there are situations where one party refuses to either participate in the arbitration and therefore refuses to pay, or a party insists on participating but will not uh, pay all or some of, of the the fees. And sometimes that results in a discussion with the arbitrator about the reasonableness of the arbitrator's fees. And I say as an aside, in the Ontario Arbitration Act, there is a provision that allows for an arbitrator's account to be assessed in the same way that a lawyer's account is assessed. Obviously, we'd all like to avoid that, uh, both parties and counsel, ever having gone through those um, such a process. They are often quite lengthy and expensive. But the arbitrator is entitled to charge reasonable fees. And so if there is some concern about those fees, it's best if both parties speak to the arbitrator together and try to work out some kind of an arrangement. What you don't want is one party to object and another party to object. That creates, I think, an uncomfortable situation uh, for, for everybody. But if the one party simply won't pay, um, the the arbitration may be suspended. It is within the arbitrator's um, power and, and ability to simply suspend or terminate the, the arbitration. And that is whether the arbitration is ad hoc or whether it is done in accordance with the procedural rules of uh, an institution. The institutional rules, rules will often contain such a term. So invariably in those situations, the claimant will pay the entire fee of the deposit and then hope that the issue will be dealt with uh, in the award and then, you know, as a cost matter, and then it, the award will be enforced. Um, it becomes an enforcement issue. And, and non-payment of the, of, of the costs rarely occurs where a party is actually participating. It is far more co common where a party is a no-show, which in itself is quite, quite rare. Apart from the fees, the terms of appointment should also deal with the expenses, the, you know, travel and accommodation. I know this sounds picky, but I've heard disputes about whether the arbitrator is to be to be reimbursed for economy or business class travel fare, for example. These are issues that simply should be considered and, and, and discussed. And I guess the last really important point is the cancellation fee, which will invariably be in the arbitrator's term of appointment. And those are, uh, cancellation fees are not standard. They, they often depend, um, they vary from arbitrator to arbitrator, but they're, they're designed primarily to deal with a situation in which a, a matter settles on the eve of the hearing and the arbitrator has res reserved two weeks for the hearing and now has nothing to fill it. Um, and so there is, uh, sometimes the arbitrator will say a portion of the number of days, you know, 50% of say a 10 day hearing will be the per diem rate will be paid um, to the arbitrator. So it's usually a, a give and take type type arrangement. But, but it does actually benefit the parties in many cases as well, because it actually does drive the incentive for parties to stay on track and stay on schedule and to estimate a reasonable amount of time for 
the proceeding. So by overestimating, I'm only I'm I'm going to need a month, and you really only take two weeks. You do risk uh, falling afoul of the the uh, cancellation adjournment. Um, you know, type policy, because those policies are meant to encompass that situation. Um, and it also encourages early settlement discussion, because the parties want to avoid the cancellation policy. And I find that in my experience to be a very powerful incentive. And council love it, because the hardest thing for council is to be both preparing for your hearing and also engaging in settlement discussions at the same time. So the count the cancellation fee is is must be detailed and and my opinion is that it advantages both the arbitrator and and the parties. There are some differences in the terms of appointment that you might see in an a, an agreement with a, a three person tribunal. So I often see terms that indicate who, which party appointed which arbitrator and on what day. And all of this is just to confirm that the arbitrators have all been a, a appointed. It also often contains the term that I talked about earlier, which is confirming that, that no matter who appointed which arbitrator, all arbitrators are acting independently and impartially. And it will often contain a no ex parte communication uh, term. And that includes not only uh, communications passing between say one tribunal member and another party without uh, any of the other tribunal members being present, but also uh, one party speaking to the, or communicating with the tribunal without, without uh, copying the other, the other party. Fees. Fees are a little bit different when a three-party panel is being appointed because you cannot always finalize the fees until after the tribunal has been appointed. And there's very good reason for that. You want all of the tribunal members to be paid the same amount. You want them to put in the same effort subject to the possibility that because the chair has a unique role, the chair may be paid more. So in the inquiries that you're making pre-appointment, you're getting a sense of what the parties, what the, what the arbitrator's fees are. And hopefully counsel are talking to one another about what they think an appropriate fee will be uh, to the panel. And that it once the panel is appointed, that's a negotiation that takes place um, to make sure that there's a lack, uh, not a lack of equity or a problem within the the uh, the dynamics of the tribunal by having very varying, varying um, hourly rates, which means that if you are communicating with your party appointee in advance of appointment about this, you it, it's probably not wise to commit to a specific hourly rate, and I, and most experienced arbitrators will will understand that. What about if the arbitration is administered by the institution or the institution is the appointing authority? The terms of reference you can find on the websites of a lot of the uh, ar uh, arbitral institutions contain great precedence because, for example, the ICC model terms of reference are very, very detailed and you can pick and choose the the. Uh, provisions that you want. There are under the ICC rules, mandatory terms, which must be in the terms of reference, but many of them are optional. So the terms of reference must contain the names of the parties, the contact information, summary of the claims, the quantum, the list of issues to be decided, the seat and, and, and the rules, but they may include uh, the procedural history, the constitution of the tribunal, the arbitration agreement, the um, inclusion of an arbitral secretary, if that's what the parties want, and issues that may arise like jurisdiction objections, those sorts of things. So they can be as detailed as the parties want and as customized as they want. Fees for the arbitral tribunal, I've always already talked a little bit about the fact that it's it's those fees cannot be decided until the tribunal has been constituted. But if the tribunal, if the arbitration is being administered by a institution, it is the institution that will set the fee and it is the institution that will handle the money. So if the tribunal is ad, ad hoc, the, the, the accounts uh, and the deposits are actually paid to the arbitrator or in the case of a three-person tribun tribunal, usually the chair, but where an institution is involved, it handles all the money. 
and also, you know, the release of funds and, and, and the billing, the invoices and all that sort of thing. So I've now reached about 1245, which is where I said I would stop. Um, so all participants will be getting a recording of this session. And as I said, a list of pre precedents um, and resources that I've spoken to. Just want to tell you a little bit about what's up next. On November the 10th, I'm going to do a, a, a second session, which I'm calling Ethical Issues Part 1, Best Practices for Pre-Appointment Communications with the Arbitrator. And that's where I'm going to talk about how to make the approach to an arbitrator that you're interested in appointing and how to get information to make that ultimate decision without compromising the process or raising potential issues that could give rise to a conflict of interest. I'm, I've uh, um, applied to the Law Society for professionalism credits for that session, and I'll, I'll uh, let people know who are interested um, once I get an answer from the Law Society. So that's the end of uh, my formal remarks. I don't see any questions in the uh, in the Q&A. Now's your time to ask uh, questions you didn't have a chance to, to ask. Okay, I've got one that's just come in. In your view or experience, is there any difference in the roles played by a neutral arbitrator and a party appointed arbitrator in a panel? While they must all act independently and impartially, does the party appointed arbitrator have a duty to ensure that the arguments of the party having appointed them are dealt with by the tribunal. And you've identified exactly the issue and it's yes. So you often hear counsel uh, uh, arbitrators who are appointed for a party say that their job is to simply ensure that the party that appointed them is heard in the arbitration. It's not to advocate. And I'm very, I feel uh, that's a very, very, important point to make. They are not the advocates for the party. They are there to make sure that the process is fair to that party. And 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 many of the the uh, institutional rules, uh, rules provide for a, a specific form to be signed by the tribunal, which says, I, I will be independent and I will be impartial. So it's a commitment that the arbitrator makes whether or not it's a sole arbitrator or a party, party appointed arbitrator to act independently and impartially. So if three are, if there is a three arbitrator panel and all disagree with each other in their decision, the chair's decision rules. That is certainly the case if it's if if that provision is found in many in in the rules and many institutional rules contain that type of provision. And I don't know what the case law says about that. Another reason why choosing the rules of a specific institution in my opinion even if the institution doesn't administer the arbitration is wise because the the institution has thought about a lot of issues that parties and their counsel may not contemplate will arise. In your view and experience, how important is it for arbitrators to be learned in the substantive law applicable to the dispute? Um, that you know, that's a hard, a hard question to answer because lawyers who are and arbitrators who do international arbitration very often are dealing with the substantive law of a jurisdiction in which they are, you know, not called to the bar. And so the, the question really is what tools are available to arbitrators to, to learn that law. There is, uh, first of all, the party's obligation is to, is to educate the arbitrator on that law. And, and those of you who are familiar with the Uber decision, everybody knows what the ultimate finding was, but there are so many interesting little issues that we could talk about just Uber. One of those issues is that the parties did not uh, educate the, the, um, the court about the substantive law of the Netherlands, which was the law of the arbitration agreement, the law that the substantive law that that uh, applied according to the arbitration agreement. And so the issues that the Supreme Court of Canada addressed relating to the validity of the arbitration clause were considered in accordance with Canadian law, because that court didn't have evidence from any of the uh, 
other uh, uh, any of the parties on what the law of the Netherlands is. So it's really the the, the responsibility of the the council to educate the arbitrator, and uh, you may in 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 choosing a three person tribunal, for example want to have one member of the tribunal with experience in that law or or all three so that's one of the criteria that you 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 as a party can choose but is it necessary not necessarily and many arbitrator uh, arbitrations proceed where arbitrators are dealing with a law that, that that is not their kind of home jurisdiction law Next question. You discuss situations where a party may not pay a portion of the fees, but what steps should be taken where a party will not pay the initial retainer deposit to the arbitrator? If the, first of all, if the, it's the claimant who doesn't pay, the arbitration will never get off the, gr the ground. If it's the respondent who doesn't pay, then then you're back to the situation that I described, that the, the arbitrator, the, the, party, usually the claimant, who wants to proceed by way of lit uh, arbitration has two choices, either to abandon the arbitration and sue in the courts, or to pay the responding party's installment and proceed with the arbitration. And the arbitrator may proceed in the absence of a recalcitrant party. Okay, last chance for questions. And I don't see any. Uh, so it is just, uh, it's just about five minutes to one. So as I promised, I've gotten you out. Um, great to see such a, a large turnout. I hope you found this helpful. And I hope you'll tune in um, to the next session. And you should be getting some information about it, uh, either end of this week or beginning of next week. Have a great day.